The Man Gulch Disaster is a story of a race. Located in a rugged area of central Montana, the Man Gulch runs into the Missouri River. In such inaccessible areas, fire is always a worry. By late summer of 1949, central Montana was so bone dry that the U.S. Forest Service put the fire potential at 74 on a scale of 100, which meant explosive potential. 25 miles to the south, Helena was reaching a record temperature for the day at 97 degrees Fahrenheit, or 36 degrees Celsius. The smoke jumpers in the race, excluding 33-year-old crew chief R. Wagner Dodge and Ranger Jim Harrison, all were between ages 17 and 28 and unmarried. Seven of them forestry students and 12 had seen military service. Several were World War II veterans including David Navon a former lieutenant in the 101st Airborne Division who had parachuted into Bastogne, Belgium, during the 1944 German counter-offensive. They were a highly select group and often described themselves as professional adventurers. A man of few words, Wagner Dodge had fought many fires during his nine years in the business and was known for the technical expertise he brought to the attack. But in this mission, he was an unknown leader to many of the men under him. Several had worked with him before, all knew of him. But they had never worked together as a distinct group under Dodge or anyone else. And Dodge himself was not even sure of all their names. A lightning storm passed over the Man Gulch area at 4 p.m. on August 4, 1949. It was believed to have set a small fire in a dead tree. August fires often begin late in the afternoon, as lightning rumbles through, and most of them are small enough to be contained by the fall of the morning. They came to be referred to as 10 o'clock fire, meaning a fire that can be surrounded and completely isolated by 10 the next morning. After the fire was detected by Ranger James Harrison, the smoke jumpers were dispatched to fight it. 16 jumpers and one spotter flew out of Missoula, Montana, at 2.30 p.m in a converted C-47 transport aircraft. They arrived over the fire at about 3.15 p.m. The fire was smoking up, and from the plane the crew could see the dull red flames chewing away at the green timber. The fire looked small from the air, like 10 or 20 acres. At the time the crew jumped into the fire, it was classified as a Class C fire, meaning the scope was between 10 and 99 acres. The spotter figured, the crew could have it under control, by 10 the next morning. People rationalized this image and therefore, when the smoke jumpers landed at Man Gulch, they expected to find, what they had come to call, a 10 o'clock fire. The plane circled the fire two or three times, while the spotter and Wag Dodge, discussed the situation, and decided on a jump spot. Most of the smoke jumpers were air sick from the long flight over, and one of them, Merle Stratton, got so nauseous that the spotter would not let him jump. Stratton returned to the base with the plane. Wind conditions that day were very unstable, and the plane was bouncing about in the turbulence. The smoke jumpers and their cargo were dropped on the south side of Man Gulch at 4.10 p.m. from 2,000 feet rather than the normal 1,200 feet due to this turbulence. They landed on the ground, half a mile from the fire. The parachute that was connected to their radio failed to open, pulverizing the radio when it hit the ground. The map of the area was falsely believed to be in the hands of the ranger, James Harrison. James Harrison was a smoke chaser from the nearby Meriwether Canyon compound who had been fighting the fire for past four hours, all by himself. The fire had spread in the hour the crew had taken to get organized. And the wind was blowing briskly towards them carrying the smell of smoke and heat. At about 5.10 p.m., the group of men started to move along the south side of the gulch to surround the fire. Dodge and Harrison, however, having scouted ahead, were worried that the thick forest near which they landed might be a death trap. As Dodge approached the fire line, he made his first of three terrible discoveries. The blaze was far more dangerous than what he had seen or guessed from the aerial reconnaissance. They told the second-in-command, William Hellman, to take the crew across to the north side of the gulch and march them towards the river along the side of the hill. 
While Hellman did this, Dodge and Harrison ate a quick meal. As the men moved down the gulch, without Dodge in the lead, the firefighters became divided into two. As much as 500 feet separated the two subgroups, neither of which was quite sure where the other was. 20 minutes later, at 5.40 p.m., Dodge finally regrouped his men and took his position at the head of the line, moving towards the river. Here, he made his second terrible discovery. The dry conditions and high winds, along with a change in wind direction, caused the fire to suddenly expand. Fiery eddies had closed the escape route towards which his men were marching. At 5.45 p.m., Dodge saw the fire cross the gulch just 200 yards ahead and was moving towards them. Saying nothing to his crew, he reversed course, turned the men around, had them angle up the hill towards the ridge at the top, and then to the other side of the hill, which was ironically called Rescue Gulch. Fires do not stop at ridge tops, they only momentarily slow down. The crew kicked into a run up the left-hand side of the gulch. The fire, at this point, was less than 100 yards behind them and closing fast. It was later estimated that during this blow-up stage, the fire covered 3,000 acres in 10 minutes. And this is where Dodge made his third and most terrifying discovery of the day. A forest fire rarely moves at more than 350 feet per minute, an advance that smoke jumpers can always outrun. But Man Gulch was part of a transitional zone, an area where mountains yield to plains and forest timber to prairie grass. They were soon moving through bunch grass, which were two and half feet tall, and were quickly losing ground to the 30 feet high flames, which were racing towards them at 610 feet per minute. Dodge estimated that within a minute or two, or perhaps sooner, he and his men would be overtaken by the fire. Dodge yelled at the crew to drop their tools and move as fast as they possibly could. But the wind was increasing and the roar of the fire made it increasingly difficult to hear ordinary conversation. Besides, many of the jumpers were yet unconcerned and did not do as Dodge had instructed. David Navon was taking pictures of the fire with his small camera. Another was still carrying a five-gallon tin of water, believing that they would need it later. They were all struggling up the steep slope at a fast walk. The fire was catching up with the crew. The fire seemed to be behind them and to their left, and the men could smell the smoke and feel the heat. The men were completely exhausted from their hurried climb up the mountainside, but now they increased their pace through fear. They all knew the danger they were in now. Hot ashes had begun falling around them when Dodge realized that the fire was upon them and they will not be able to make it to the top and across the ridge in time. At 5.55 p.m., Dodge abruptly stopped. From the matchbox he carried, he lit a match and threw it into the prairie grass in front of him. His fire burned fast and instantly became a widening circle of flame. He jumped into the blazing ring, moved to its smoldering center, wrapped a cloth around his face, pressed himself close to the ground, and waited. Dodge had not forgotten his crew. As the men rushed past, or stumbled on a stop Dodge, they saw their boss waving frantically at them to come inside an expanding ring of fire. This way, Dodge shouted. He motioned and yelled to his men, but many could not hear him, as his shouted orders were lost in the roar of fire, even to those who were close by. No one stopped, and all his men ran past his ring. Two people, Sally and Rumsey, glanced at Dodge, but kept going, rounding his fire circle, mounting the ridge to their left, and moving down the other side. They made it through a crevice, chanced upon a bare spot in the ridge, and like Dodge came out unscathed and unburned. The remaining 13 men, also rushed by Dodge and his widening circle of flame. However, their stars were not as propitious. The 13 chanced upon no bare spots. As Dodge had anticipated, they were quickly overtaken by the prairie grass fire they could not outrun. After the fire passed, Rumsey and Sally suddenly heard a call from below, and they hurried off in the direction of the sound. It was William Hellman. He was alive, but severely burned. 
they laid him on a long flat rock to keep his burns out of the ashes and soot. There was not much else they could do as all their first aid supplies were discarded on their race up the mountain. It was then that Dodge joined them. He told the three jumpers that he had found Joseph Sylvia alive and not severely burned. Dodge then decided that Rumsey would stay to care for Hellman while he and Sally would go down the river for help. They had a tough time finding their way down the hill towards the Missouri River in the dark of the night, but their luck changed when a fisherman passing by in his boat heard their shouts and took them to Hilger Landing. They walked into the Meriwether Ranger Station at 8.50 p.m. and rescue parties immediately set out to recover the dead and the dying. William Hellman died at noon the next day. Joseph Sylvia lived for a short while and then died. The hands on James Harrison's watch melted at 5.56 p.m., which has been treated officially as the time all the 13 people died. All the dead were found in an area of 100 by 200 yards. It took 450 men and five more days to get the 4,500-acre Man Gulch fire under control. It was the worst firefighting disaster in U.S. Forest Service history and would remain so for 45 years. Until 14 men and women were killed on July 6, 1994, on Storm King Mountain, near Glenwood Springs, Colorado, combating a vicious, wind-driven grass fire, which would also suddenly engulf them.